is it shouldn't and you should be if you kind of sit here you should be able to see it well enough like maybe right here yeah maybe like yeah. Yeah, what's happening now it's, it oh it's like it's doing it right yeah. welcome to the plowshares room chat okay yeah so uh, how can you, how about the audio? How can you tell about that? The audio? Yeah. Hi, people watching. Um, there. Yeah, I turned it. Okay, so that's about right, you know? Are you Probably. sure? Maybe I'll turn it down. Just yeah, just, just a little bit. Okay. So. Uh, is this still in the right place? Yeah, it should go. <laughs> no, it's okay. Can. Uh, do you want me to stand in this place? Yeah, please. That's pretty good, right? Yeah. Okay. And did you need to come up every so often and, like, do this? Could you, um, no, you shouldn't have to okay. touch anything. Just like me. Okay. It's a little bit after eight. I wonder if you all would be willing to move up a little closer to the front um, so that we don't make Trish feel like she's speaking to the back of the crowd. Thank you so much. You're so nice. Um, welcome. My name is Ledette Randolph. I'm editor in chief of Plowshares Magazine. I'm really glad to see all of you here tonight. Um, there are people to thank for this evening. Um, Thank you to Steve Yarbrough and Gerald Walker um, and other colleagues in the writing, literature, and publishing department who have collaborated on this reading series. This is uh, the first year that we're starting to collaborate, so I'm glad to see this group here. Also, thank you to Emerson College for making the reading possible, um, President Pelton, um, Linda Moore, and uh, Dan Tobin. And then, all, as always, the Plowshares Advisory Board uh, appreciate their support. Marilyn Zachris, Alice Hoffman, Tom Martin, and Larry, Janet Silver, Dan Tobin, Pam Painter, and DeWitt Henry. 
Um, and then, of course, thanks especially to the staff at Plowshares, um, without whom there is no magazine. Um, fiction editor Margot Livesey, poetry editor John Scoyles, managing editor Andrea Dragas, which uh, who we all know just makes everything happen. Production manager Akshay Ahuja, um, and editorial assistants Abby Travis and Miriam Cook. And to our many interns and volunteer readers um, whose unsung and unpaid work is priceless to our mission. I know there are several of you in the room tonight. Um, so if, if you aren't a subscriber to the journal, I hope you'll consider becoming one. Um, the uh, subscription forms are in the back, the auditorium. We're here tonight to celebrate the fall 2012 issue of the magazine, um, which is a nonfiction only issue edited by our guest tonight. Patricia Campbell. Um, and copies of her issue are also available for sale in the back, as are copies of her books, I believe. Am I right? Good. Okay. And uh, I think she'll be willing to sign copies afterward. Good. So before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone to silence your cell phones, please. And uh, you don't have to do that. You all just look at me like you already did that. You're so, wow, you're so grown up. Um, Tonight, I've asked my distinguished colleague, Margo Livesey, to introduce Patricia Hampel. Margo, as many of you know, is the author of seven books, six novels, and a short story collection. Her most recent novel, The Flight of Gemma Hardy, was published earlier this year to great critical acclaim. She's a recipient of numerous grants and awards, including grants from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. Although she has taught at a number of colleges, around the country, it's our very good fortune that she's currently a distinguished writer in residence in the writing, literature, and publishing departments from Madison College. Welcome, Margo. I'm a very clumsy person, so we'll see if I can coordinate two sheets of paper and a microphone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ladette, for that lovely introduction, and thank all of you for coming this evening. Tolstoy told us that art is an experience, and I can tell you that you are in for an exhilarating experience. I'm honored and hugely pleased to introduce Patricia Hampel. In the interest of full disclosure, I should say that Trish has become a dear friend, but I knew her first as a writer, the author of two remarkable memoirs, a Romantic Education and Virgin Time. Although just earlier this afternoon she was saying that the word memoir wasn't entirely around when she published these books and so maybe I shouldn't use it. I still remember that first meeting at the Breadloaf Writers Conference sometime in the 90s. I'm not quite sure when and I don't want to age us by claiming a date. Um, and the pleasure of discovering that this woman who wrote with such wit, erudition, and eloquence also brought those qualities to bear on such quotidian matters as the bread loaf cuisine or what to wear. Since then, Hampel has written two more uh, books of nonfiction, uh, Blue Arabesque and The Florist's Daughter, and a fabulous collection of essays, No Writer Should Be Without It, called I Could Tell You Stories. She's one of that handful of indispensable writers whose work I really do wait for eagerly. I know you see this on the back of all kinds of books, but do people really mean it? Well, I really mean it. In the introduction to I Could Tell You Stories, Hanfel says, writers write about writing and about books, not because, like us, books turn to dust, but because, like us, they are born of flesh, and you can feel the blood beat along their pulse. Yes, I think, as I read this gorgeous sentence. I, and then, almost at once, I have the less generous thought, but not all books. Indeed, not many books have even a faint pulse, let alone the vivid heartbeat of Hampel's work. Hampel was born, grew up, and now lives in St. Paul, Minnesota, which I think she calls God's country, or maybe that was her mother. <laughs> uh, she attended the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop and began her writing life as a poet, publishing two wonderful collections. Indeed, the practice 
practice of poetry still, to my mind, lies at the heart of her work. Her memoirs, even as they negotiate the weight of time, which is the duty of all narrative, slip limply free of that weight to write about the life that lies beyond or outside our diurnal concerns. In Virgin Time, Hample explicitly explores the mysteries of faith and pilgrimage, but all her work is concerned with the truth that lies beyond absolute occurrence, to borrow a phrase from Tim O'Brien's um, How to Tell a True War Story. Since turning to memoirs, Hample has in several ways redefined the possibilities of the form, and her accomplishments have been recognized both at home, where she is Regents Professor and McKnight Distinguished Professor at the University of Minnesota, and in the wider world of letters. She is the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship and numerous other awards. She's also on the permanent faculty of the Prague Summer, Writer, Summer Writing Program. It's wonderful to see a writer I admire so much being so widely recognized, but I and her many other devoted readers didn't need the MacArthur Foundation to tell us that she's a genius. When I think about Hample's work, what for me is the experience of her work? The closest analogy I can think of is of watching some of the great British stage actors, Helen Mirren, Fiona Shaw, Vanessa Redgrave. These actors can lean against a tree, sit on a bench, fall asleep on stage, and I can't take my eyes off them. Even when they're doing nothing, they're more interesting than all the other actors on stage who are talking and quarreling and making love. Hample can describe anything, a goldfish, Victorian furniture, her father's pills, and it becomes riveting. The world is always gloriously present in her work. So too is her cunningly mediated, ever alert, always connecting self. In her essay on St. Augustine, Hample describes Augustine as seeking again the intimate embrace and healing intelligence of language. I can't think of a better description of Hample's own great gifts to her readers. Ladies and gentlemen, Patricia Hample. where I'm beginning to wonder what the final act is all about or should be about. And I see now that it's about trying to live into and inhabit the identity that Margot Lipsy has given me. <laughs> <laughs> I consider it an assignment. Thank you so much, Margot. It's one of the great things about being a writer is getting to know writers you admire and love. And getting to be pals with them. It's a, one of the secret benefits. And uh, it's been a thrill to know Margot, first of all, as a writer, then a bit afar as, as a presence at Breadloaf, and then finally as, as a real friend and that I want to sustain the rest of my life. Um, I'm also grateful to be here uh, at Emerson, which is the home to this wonderful magazine uh, that I'm also devoted to now, and not just to this issue. Uh, I want to thank Ludath and Andrea. I don't know if Abby's here. Are you here, Abby? Um, Akshay um, and and um, everyone who makes this magazine happen, and for somehow letting me stumble into the pages and and have at it. I love editing. It's been was my first job, and my second job, and occasionally has been my third job. Um, so to be able to edit with other people who care about the act and, and process of editing and putting together a magazine has meant a great deal to me. Um, so, and thanks for letting me put this crazy wacko um, cover on the front of it. This is all Abby's work, really, um, to find it, but I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, 
And I want to also thank Richard for the conversation we had this afternoon, um, which um, theoretically was me answering, but was really me inquiring deeply and uh, pondering the questions that he asked, and I, I know I'll continue doing that. Um, Andrea suggested that I read from the introduction to this um, collection of, of essays. And what I love about the instruction, because I was edited too. Uh, I was edited by Ledette, who, who suggested that my essay should not be an introduction that was telling people what they were about to read and kind of introducing the, the pieces that are here, but that I should just sort of do a fantasia of my own, something that just struck me. So the book that I'm working on, and I will read you a, a bit from that too after I, I read this shorter piece. They're both short, don't worry, I'm not in this for a long time. Um, uh, the book that I'm working on right now is called The Art of the Wasted Day. And uh, it's taken me a long time to get moving on this. And someone asked me recently, well, so how is, how is The Art of the Wasted Day going? And I said, well, the research is great. <laughs> you know? um, and so in this uh, book, which is about leisure, about daydream, about you know how you kind of invite your own fancy, to use a Whitmanian word. Um, the, the hero figure of it is uh, Michel Montaigne, the great essayist um, of the 16th century in France. And so I'll read you, um, I'm going to hopscotch a little bit. It's a short essay mine in here, but I, I'm going to um, skip bits of it. And I might even end up putting a little of this into my book, I don't know, but for now it's just where it is, right here. When you visit the statue of Montaigne in Paris, you find him amidst overgrown greenery, almost sequestered in the bushes across from the Sorbonne, as if preferring in bronze the margin he chose in life. The first thing you notice is his shoe. Even at night, when I came upon him, the shoe emerges first golden against the dusky bronze of his casually seated self, cross-legged, bending forward, as if to catch what you might be saying there on the sidewalk. People rub the shoe for luck or maybe out of affection. A shoe rub is sent to ensure a good exam result. It glows from all this human touch. An elegant 16th century Mary Jane dancing slipper blushing from generations of 20th century fondling. The sculptor, Paul Ladowski, is better known for his gigantic 1931 Flash Gordon statue of Christ the Redeemer overlooking Rio de Janeiro. Montaigne's statue was done two years later, in 1933, perhaps to commemorate the 400th anniversary of his birth in 1533. Something of the dandy about that shoe then you notice the face, surprisingly intent looking back at you, the face of a man who appreciates the finer things, but is wryly amused by this weakness for pleasure, not haunted by his appetites. Landowski has given Montaigne a 20th century face, nonchalant, worldly, warm, almost an American face, a humanist face. This Montaigne, like the one I've been reading in recent years, sees it all and accepts it all in advance. The all of human per perversity and contradiction played out on a field of avidity and longing. It was raining that night, and though I'm urging a visit to the statue as if to a shrine, I didn't visit it. I just happened upon it, running late, trying to locate a fish restaurant recommended by a friend who knows Paris, dripping in his leafy bower by the university, gleaming from the wet, well, maybe because I'd been reading him, living with his sinuous sentences in my head and had no such idea that the statue existed. This bronze Montaigne had something of the apparition about him. Like Whitman, another eccentric of the first person voice, he was loafing by the side of the road. Out with the iPhone, snap, snap, got the shoe, didn't quite, couldn't quite get the face. I had made an earlier pilgrimage to the famous tower on the Chateau property near Bordeaux, had stood alone in the rounded room, imagined it once ringed with books, 
the stony enclosure where his, he devised his pieces, some shorter than a page, others long enough to make a chapbook, the writing he called his essay. He had refused to outfit the study with a fireplace, imagine the cold in winter, in order to safeguard his precious library. I had checked out as well the adjacent alcove where he did allow a fireplace, a cramped space to warm himself. On the walls, I made out what was left of the painted frescoes, naked nymphs and godlets mostly, bundles of chipped floral decor, and the graffiti of earlier visitors scrawled Emma, 1882, and Pierre, 1920. And someone whose name or message I couldn't decipher, the date, 1989, the most recent I found. I looked out the window of the alcove to experience, or think I was experiencing, his view. May, a great blossoming marronier, part of the allée of chestnut trees, marshaled along a gravel roadway leading to the tower. Nearer, just below, a triangular untended parterre garden where I imagined herbs. Surely he ate well. He tells us he loved rich sauces, delicately flavored. I turned back for the main room, his writing room, intending to take some descriptive notes, hoping for an insight to the book I was, I am, writing, an earnest essayist acting the part. With this in mind, turning quickly, gaze angled down to my notebook, I misjudged the space, an earlier century, a smaller scale, and smacked my head into the stone wall. You do see stars, or bits of white spinning, that you could think of as stars. Then in my bell ringing, star shooting brain, I remembered that Montaigne had whacked his head too, colliding with another rider, knocked unconscious, semi-conscious, from his horse as he rode into the woods of his property. He was taken as dead, and his men carried him insensible back to the chateau. It is one of the few recognizably memoiristic vignettes in the essay, a scrupulous reconstruction of this pivotal autobiographical episode, this bit of story in the midst of all these pages of musing, pondering, reflecting, wondering, what used to be called philosophizing. You do get knocked off balance, off your assumptions. You see stars or what you take for stars. Your life changes, is changed. Even in our handy cliché, we routinely speak of being struck by this or that. The point is you see a fresh kind of scene. To express accurately your, your experience, you must paradoxically be knocked out of yourself, knocked out of the inevitable narcissism and egotism that is our narrative lot. This quicksilver experience has been given by literature and psychology the lackluster label detachment. Montaigne's younger brother had been hit on the head too, a tennis ball to the temple. He didn't experience, so far as we know, detachment. He died of his blow. In the 16th century, tennis balls were made of wood. So perhaps Montaigne had an astonished even slightly grateful, guilty sense of dumb luck in surviving his fall, because unlike his brother, he came too. But surely he registered as well. His description of the experience proves this. The significance of his head wound. It gave him a new, enlarged consciousness. In his essay, he found the purpose of his self, to see and then to say. The personal essay was born of that smack upside the head. And that's why, I mean, it goes on, but that's why I asked Ledet and was allowed to do an all essay, all nonfiction issue, because I wanted to see what people were up to writing this particular form, the personal essay, the first person voice um, at play in the field of experience and consciousness. The book that I mentioned I'm going to read to you from um, has Montaigne sort of as, as a, a hero figure in it. And I, I alone, I'm the only one, and now you, to know that this is one of what I consider the final book in a trilogy of uh, books 
um, devoted to the arts, and the first one was Philville, which was about Antonin Dvorak in Iowa, um, and me in Iowa. And the second one was Blue Arabesque, which is uh, in part about a number of people, but centrally about Matisse in the south of France and me in the south of France. And this one is about, so we have, you know, music, which I was a music major to start with, piano performance. And like a lot of failures, I then toddled off to the English department, became an English major, <laughs> not being able to be uh, the music major I wanted to be. And then um, the second one, visual arts, and this one returns home plate to literature, and specifically the essay as being the most uh, free form in all of the genres that we, that we look at, um, and most attached to the individual voice. Um, and Motang being the progenitor of the form, it becomes sort of a hero figure here. So I get to go back to France again. Darn, have to, have to go to France. Um, a little, little reference to Montaigne even in this piece, which is called Of Piano. So you remember Montaigne often is writing about something and he'll say of this or of that, and then he goes off on the subject that isn't a whole lot about the thing that he titled the essay as. Um, Montaigne had a very extraordinary father. His father not only adored him uh, and indulged him in many ways, but he had a lot of fancy theories about education, and one of them was that children should not be awakened harshly because they came from a deeper sleep than adults do. And so not having an iPod or having any kind of Bose uh, uh, equipment, he hired a lutenist to wake up his child. And this uh, man, this lute player, every day followed Montaigne around and had a sort of um, soundtrack, a very gentle soundtrack. <laughs> um, that kind of makes a reference here, I think, at some point. So of pianos. The piano lessons started early, age eight. Mine was another father determined to fill his child's mind with music. Not long afterward, the Sunday dinner recitals began, aunts and uncles sitting docilely with their coffee. I'm told to go to the piano. My father pulls rosin along the bow of his violin. How about a duet for everyone, Patricia? We seesaw our way along Dvorak's humoresque number nine. These domestic displays were only the tip of my iceberg. Hours of practice of daydream repetition led me along the narrow creaking corridor of my convent school to the little cell filled up with a grand piano. The window overlooked the cloister garden, a nun drifting below, reading her breviary. Angela's time, after lunch, everyone else playing softball, screaming madly in the distance. I could hardly wait to get to that room. Not to practice, I just played, reinscribing errors and miscues in erratic tempi. Sister Mary Louise, preternaturally patient, did what she could. I was supposed to use the metronome, but I almost never did, maddened by its pedantic tick-tocking. It was interrupting me. Interrupting what, ma chère? Daydreams, the mind cantering over its landscape like an unbroken pony. The piano was a romantic soundtrack, not work I was doing. I was toiling elsewhere. Well, I wasn't toiling. That was the point, that was the pleasure. I was swooning. I was, how did he put it? Sluggish, lax, drowsy. That's a description earlier in the book that Montaigne makes of himself. How did he put it? Sluggish, lax, drowsy. Music made these travels possible. My hands moved over the keyboard. My mind went anywhere I wanted to go. Paris and New York were familiar destinations all the more vivid for knowing nothing about them, not even anyone who had seen them. I also visited or revisited the insides of certain books. The coach, Becky Sharp, throws Dr. Johnson's dictionary out of. Tennyson's flower plucked root and all from the crannied wall. Blake's grain of sand, Ezra Pound's petals on a wet black bough. Sister Maria Chaley introduced all of them to us in English class. They pulled me, pulled me back, or maybe they pushed me forward. 
I circled around them, kept circling. I also had to build a case against my brother, who was a bully, and against my mother, who sided with my brother. I had to wonder why I wasn't one of the pretty ones. Or was I, awaiting the right person to see beneath the surface? Think Jane Eyre. I was busy. I wrote poems up there, kept a diary. I didn't think of any of these sketchy bits of writing as essays. I called them nothing at all. It wasn't writing. It was me. Ainsi, la cœur, je suis moi-même le maître de mon vie. So reader, as Montaigne writes, I am myself the material of my book. Montaigne's inaugural words are the motto of every diary. Montaigne worried uh, Montaigne warned the reader against reading someone else's musings, his own, even while knowing full well he was going to publish the book. After all, it was for sale to the public. You would be unreasonable to spend your leisure on so frivolous and vain a subject, he says in his opening address to the reader. But who has not been tempted to open a journal, a letter left on a hallway table, or, for those convinced of their honor, at least a postcard left face up. Montaigne knew his essays presented a fascination, even a slightly illicit one. He knew his reader perhaps better than he knew himself, as writers do, being passionate readers before they become writers, and therefore knowing what allures, what enchants. It had a lock and a key, the first book I wrote, a red leather at five-year diary, the lock and the key were the most important part. Absolute privacy, the invitation to candor, a book that was a room to live in alone. So writing was not fundamentally storytelling, it was attention. The hunting and gathering stage of civilization, the collecting of what? Truth, not the truth, as it was pervaded in religion class, swanning forward immutable grandiose, the brittle carapace of dogma holding it aloft. This other truth was fluid, the mote in the eye, the sniff of the nose, the stroke of the hand reaching out. It was the truth of noticing bits, pieces, the patchwork of reality. It had no superstructure, it had no system. Its order was the integrity of the eye, moving over chaos, but repudiating chaos by the act of its attention. The mind displayed in a tumble of sentences was the world's organizing angel, the companion of a life. To notice was to follow faithfully, a faithful companion. Whither thou goest, I will go. Every few months, Sister Mary Louise handed me new sheet music. I never knew exactly when this would happen, but it always renewed my flagging, entirely phony dedication to discipline. Getting new shoot cheat music meant turning over a literal new leaf. I hadn't mastered the earlier pieces, but I suppose Sister felt I'd gone as far as I was going to get given my loose practice habits. New music might help. Her moist, protuberant eyes shone behind her glasses, radiating an unshakable trust in extending the second, the third, the ever renewable next chance. The new music, often from European publishers, was crisp and fresh. Sister's favorites and mine came from France, the cream pages of Edition, A, Durand et Fils, the publishers of Saint-Saëns and Debussy. Durand employed a sinuous Art Nouveau font for its covers, its address printed at the bottom left. The words Rue and Paris attested to its exotic bona fides, yet also to a real place you could get to if you somehow could get yourself to Paris, unlikely as that was. The paper was thin, so porous it attracted dirt and smudges. The willowy pages were taller than stout American sheet music. I knew from experience it would soon lose its starch. The pages would go limp on the music stand, soften at the edges, wrinkle and tear as I hauled them back and forth from home to school. Before long, the luscious cream pages would be shabby, the allure lost. But I always forgot this on the day I received the new sheets. On New Music Days, today was always the first day of the rest of my life of good intentions. Today, I was a believer, 
Perfection was very near. I could touch it. A Saturday morning in May, therefore, and I had biked on my blue Raleigh three-speed to the convent and been admitted by Sister Portress to the strangely empty hall, so empty and now, but so busy during the week, up the dark staircase to the fourth floor where Sister Mary Louise awaited me. The room was spacious, but like all music studios, it felt cramped, two baby grands bulging their big hips at each other, a big white bust of Chopin on one, a bloodless Schubert on the other. The windows of the studio were tall, set so high, the view was all sky, and the ends of a few beseeching elm trees freshly budded. The aerial view gave the odd sensation of being on a plane, though I had never been on a plane. No problem. Mind travel in the practice room had provided the experience of flight long ago. <coughs> on windy days, the big panes of glass rattled in their sashes. This early day in May was very windy, overcast, clouds bundling their way from window to window in a big, troubled hurry, the windows clattering. Today we begin again. This is how Sister Mary Louise spoke on new music days. She too was a believer. What else? She was a nun after all. She beamed at me. I was a good girl and such a talker. I could make her laugh. I could surprise her just by saying how something struck me. When the rain hits the black asphalt on the street, I told her one day, it looks just like ballerinas on point. However did you think of that, she said in her mild, astonished way. Once I said I wished science would come up with a pill for breakfast, lunch, and dinner so a person wouldn't have to stop reading for meals and of course there would be no dishes to do. She looked appalled, as if I had suggested something shameful. Some of us look forward to our dinner, she said, abashed, her plump self settled under the black tarp of her habit. Today we begin again. She rose from her chair and went to the tall oak cupboard along the back wall where the sheet music was neatly stacked on shelves in a system known only to her. She returned holding the unblemished folder of Debussy's La Fille aux Cheveux de Lin in its delicious addition de rang cream, the girl with the flaxen hair, one of the watery pieces she favored. She sat at the other piano and played it straight through the lilt of lyrical girl who had floated with aquatic ease from her capable hands over the light and dark waters of the Impressionists. She handed me the music. I opened the virgin sheets carefully while she reminded me that the metronome was my friend and counted out as usual, count, dear, count. She reached over and made several marks on the music with her soft pencil to indicate the fingering she wanted me to follow, sometimes overruling the printed fingering of Durand et Fils. I didn't like those pencil marks. They marred the page. But at the end of the lesson, I closed the folder and placed the thin sheets carefully between my battered Bach French suites and Schubert's sturdy Moma musical, and everything was fine, though the flimsy WC extended beyond the heft of the Bach and the Schubert, but so what? The first day of the rest of my life of good intentions was still before me, still perfect, a matter of unbroken imagining. Downstairs, I retrieved my bike, rolled the music gently, positioning it in the wicker basket attached to the handlebars so nothing would be jammed or damaged. I jumped on the bike, took the curb with a frisky leap at the corner of Fairmont and Grotto, the monastic names of those streets, and flew toward home down the clickety-clack bumps of Fairmont's creosote paving. The streets still paved with these old blocks, only a few were left in the city, echoed with a memory of horse hooves when you rattled over them. Have I ever been so happy for no good reason? A bolt of ecstasy shot through me. I was in New York. No, I was in Paris, on some route just like Durand et Fils. I rode a beam of invisible light straight to heaven, which the five-year diary well knew I didn't believe in anymore, but there it was, and I was in it. The happiness rose from relief. I see that now. Relief. I hadn't been humiliated in the usual way by my lurching Bach, my Karine Schubert. 
I hadn't had to face reality. Always a happy occasion. On new music days, sister did most of the playing. Nothing was expected of me. Now on the bike, I skimmed madly downhill, demented with liberty. The girl with the flaxen hair was safe in the basket. My own brown hair blew free in the wind. I considered trying to steer hands free, which my brother said girls were no good at. How brief the bliss, how long the memory. A dark dash of rain, as if targeted, hit the moss-colored Schubert, leaving a forest green stain just as I reached the bottom of the hill. Then another, another, big jot splatting down east lazily before the deluge, polka dotting the sidewalk. I jumped off the bike at the corner of Victoria. Schubert could go, no problem sacrificing Bach. But la, cheveux, la, la fille aux cheveux de lin must be saved. I couldn't leave the music in the basket and keep riding. Debussy's cream edges peeked out from under Schubert's shabby overcoat like a delicate silk chemise. I put the bike on the kickstand, grabbed the music, lifted my blouse, and stowed the bundle against my blessedly flat chest. And there I stood, my arms crossed, the rain coming down now in earnest. Just stood there. I couldn't get on the bike. I needed both hands to hold the music in place. So my brother is right. Girls are no good at riding hands free. Where to go, what to do? I was getting drenched. This rain was no ballerina on point. Furious sheets came down at a horizontal tilt. The music was sticking to my skin. A car stopped. A man rolled down his window. Why are you crying, little girl? Are you hurt? I remember he said, little girl. I hadn't realized I was crying. Never talk to strange men. The girl with the flaxen hair is getting ruined, I sobbed across to him, maddened with misery, holding myself tightly around the chest, sniveling, snot out my nose. Never call it snot, dear. His kindly smile faded. I was a crazy child. Did I know where I lived? Of course I know where I live, I snapped at him. Never give them your address. Gently, tentatively, he offered me a ride home. He could fit my bicycle in the back, he said. Nothing doing, mister. Never give him a stranger's car. My new music getting all ruined, I sobbed, furious at him for being available and yet not available, enraged at him for being a stranger. If I would tell him where I lived, he said sensibly, he could deliver the music safely and I could ride home on my bike. Would, would that be okay? I stared at him. Decision time. I walked over to the car, fished the music out from under my shirt, thrust it in his window. The girl with the flaxen hair would have to go off with the stranger. I gave him our address. Well, that's just a few blocks away, he said. He smiled as if the problem were solved. He told me to ride home safely. Stay on the sidewalks, he said. The creosote blocks get slippery in the rain, a, a remark my father would make. That's all, except for my mother's ferocity, the result of her heart-stopping terror when she looked out the window to see a man, a stranger, walking up the front stairs with my sheet music, the familiar Schubert and Bach and no me. I thought you'd been hit by a car. I thought you were dead. She seemed exasperated that I wasn't. Why on earth, she wanted to know, didn't I just keep riding home in the rain? I was so near. We could have put the sheet music on the radiator to dry. No harm done. Everything would be fine. I was making a mountain out of a molehill, as usual. And her sensible sigh. Don't act like a sausage. It's nothing to cry over. <laughs> but mother, there's always something to cry over, to think over, muse over, fret and fume over. Crying is only part of it, not even the important part, though the most theatrical. The little red book, the lock, was getting it earful tonight. The WC had absorbed a little of Schubert's green, ruined. Nothing is perfect for long, though sometimes it's perfect for a little while. It can only be pried out at the moment sequestered between the red leatherette covers where it begins its career as a memory. Bits of reality 
are pressed to the pages like wildflowers, flattened and faded, but there. Perfect register between self and world. It does sometimes occur, fugitive, fleeting. There it was in the wicker basket on the handlebars of the Raleigh three-speed for its nanosecond, worth noting. The exquisite moment when the music flowed from sister's fine old hands and then my body braved the wind, the blonde girl and I taking the turn deftly at Grotto, the horses of history clattering under the bicycle wheels. All of this in a mind full of future, revved with good intentions that would turn, I swear, my sir, into good deeds. I will practice. I will give a perfect performance next Saturday. Happiness can hold a lot of freight, and I was overloaded with joy that day the hooves of the Raleigh clicking on Fairmont before the deluge. It was nothing, nothing to cry over, nothing at all, really. But how many times has it floated me over despair just to think of that moment? The music and the speeding blue three-speed I commanded, hair whipped in the wind, the clattering old paving stones. I rolled this inner photograph gently Molto pianissimo into the kit bag of consciousness, the ground beat of being, pounding like a heart. Forte, forte. It is an absolute perfection and virtually divine to know how to use our being rightfully, Montaigne says. He's thinking of the naked men his simple crude fellow has told him he has seen in the new world. There's a touch of envy as he interviews this man who has been to the new world, or maybe simply admiring wistfulness. To be so perfect in your being, to enjoy rightfully. Utter joy is rare, divine almost, he's saying. And of course, it is found in a new world. It is always a new world. That's where it is. He would strip naked too, he says, to display his entire self in his essay. It is the purpose of such work, its glory, its humble task. The moment lies somewhere ahead, not far, when surely everything can be said. Perfect register between the instrument of the self and the mysterious machine of the world. Stand in the rain, protect the girl with the flaxen hair the fierce, fragile, lyrical self, not to hide her, not to control her, just to keep in reserve the alert intimacy of the ardent heart. There's waiting to do, always. Big part of this job, waiting. Thank you.